and they applied the tobacco industry, the strategy of emphasizing doubt, emphasizing uncertainty, to insist that the science was too uncertain to take action. Doubt is our product, ran the infamous memo written by one tobacco industry executive in 1969, since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. So this is the merchandising of doubt in a nutshell. Create doubt, exaggerate doubt, emphasize doubt, even manufacture doubt in order to compete with the true body of fact that the public knows about and is aware about, to create confusion and uncertainty. But one of the key insights the tobacco industry realized early on was that it wouldn't really do for a tobacco executive to stand up and say, well, we don't really believe that tobacco is harmful, just as it doesn't really do for a coal industry executive to stand up and say, well, we don't really believe in that global warming stuff. Most of us would be sensible enough to realize that an industry spokesman might not be independent and objective. But if a scientist said it, and in particular if a distinguished scientist, such as a former president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences said it, well, that was a whole different matter. And so the tobacco industry developed strategies for recruiting scientists. One of my favorite projects they had was something called Project White Coat, right, whose name tells you what it was all about, recruit men in laboratory coats to give credibility to this campaign. So in our story, in our book, we, we describe and discuss how this group of scientists, the scientists at the Marshall Institute, supplied doubt, but not just about tobacco, but also about the reality of acid rain, the severity of the ozone hole, and the human causes of global warming. And we also discuss a kind of revisionist attack on the science related to the harms of DDT, which continues even today. These physicists deny the severity of all of these problems, and in every single case, over and over and over again, insisted that the science was too uncertain to justify government action. Now, to learn how they did it, you'll have to read the book, which is on sale outside. But what I'll do here is just give you a very, very brief summary of what the key parts of this strategy were. The short version of the story is the systematic misrepresentation of the scientific evidence and the systematic misrepresentation of the state of scientific debate, just as the tobacco industry did before. So we see them cherry-picking data and taking data out of context. So one glacier in New Zealand that is retreating refutes all of the abundant evidence of global warming. Uh, one person who smoked five packs a day and didn't get cancer refutes all of the epidemiological evidence of the hazards of tobacco. Um, they would launch personal attacks on leading scientists, including, we saw recently, stealing the emails or attacking scientists at the University of Queensland, um, pressuring journalists to write balanced accounts. This is a big part of the strategy. Uh, sending press releases and white papers and reports to journalists to create the impression of a genuine scientific debate, even when the vast majority of actual scientists working on it are in agreement. Um, and pressuring journalists so that if a journalist wrote an account that did not give equal time to their view. They would call the journalist, they would call the editor, and in some cases actually threaten lawsuits in order to get equal time for their view. And this issue of balance, we've seen that um, repeatedly used as a strategy in, here in Australia as well with the ABC. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, finding a tiny handful of dissenting scientists, often who are not actually experts in the area in which they're pronouncing uh, but the public doesn't realize the distinction between a geologist and a climate scientist or a physicist and an oncologist. So finding this tiny handful of dissenting scientists, no, no particular reference intended there, of course, um, promoting them on television, promoting them on radio, flying them to conferences around the world, and promoting them in the print media to create the impression of a real scientific debate. In the book, we refer to this as the scientific Potemkin village. It's a facade of scientific debate when in fact, if you actually read the scientific literature, you find that there's no real scientific debate at all. So what I'd like to talk about now then for the rest of the talk is what I think was in a way the most perplexing and interesting part of the story, which is why these scientists did this. Why would a distinguished scientist like Frederick Seitz go to work for the tobacco industry? 
Why would a distinguished scientist like Robert Jastrow attack Jim Hansen, who he himself had hired at NASA? And why would Bill Nuremberg challenge the work of his own colleagues at the University of California? Why would these men risk their own reputations to engage in unscrupulous personal attacks on climate scientists? Well, many people assume that the answer would be money, that they sold out for filthy lucre, but in fact, we found no evidence in our research that any of these people personally benefited uh, financially from the work they did. I think that might not be true of some of the later people who join in, um, who have joined in more recently, but at least in the origins of the story, we find that the motivation is actually ideological. And it's the ideology that George Mar Soros has called free market fundamentalism. Free market fundamentalism is perhaps the most extreme end member of a broader range of views that are, could be broadly categorized as modern neoliberalism. A set of political views focused on deregulation and on releasing the so-called magic of the marketplace. Neoliberalism came to prominence in the early 1980s under Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and Ronald Reagan in the United States and then later John Howard here in Australia. But its intellectual roots are deeper and earlier in the ideology of two key thinkers, Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek. Milton Friedman was an American economist. He's considered to be the founder of the, the Chicago School of Economics. And his seminal work was published in 1962, interestingly, in the coldest moment of the Cold War, right around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And its title essentially encapsulates its argument, Capitalism and Freedom. Friedman's argument was that capitalism and freedom are two sides of the same coin, and that if you want to ensure and protect and preserve political liberty, you must preserve, protect, and defend economic liberty as well. Why? Well, because when, com when countries try to control an economy through a plan economy or five-year plans, invariably they must control people too. Because the only way to control markets is to control the people who are the actors in those markets. And therefore, any attempt to compromise the free market will inevitably lead to a compromise in political and social freedom. So without free markets, he argued, we're on the slippery slope to tyranny. Now, in the introduction to his book, Friedman acknowledges his debt to an earlier thinker, Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian uh, economist who's considered to be one of the founders of modern neoliberalism. Hayek fled Austria after the Anschluss, went to London where he became a professor at the London School of Economics, and he began to argue that Austrian fascism had actually arisen in response to the failures of socialism. And he became a passionate opponent of any form of socialism, not just Soviet-style dictatorial communism, but even Western European social democracy, which he saw as a slippery slope to tyranny that would put us on what he called the road to serfdom. Now, the contrarians in our story take this argument even one step further. They argue that environmentalism is the slippery slope to socialism, and therefore tyranny, because environmentalists almost invariably argued for government regulation. If we think about all of these issues, tobacco, acid rain, ozone, global warming, DDT, they all involve the conclusion that the government, that our governments, needed to step in to control tobacco use, to prevent acid rain, to protect the ozone hole. And in their opinion, it was only a small step then from government control of tobacco to government control of our lives. This idea was articulated by, in many different ways uh, in their writings, but most clearly by a fourth scientist who joined the cause, and that was this man, S. Fred Singer. Singer's biography was remarkably similar to the other three. He was also a Cold War physicist. In fact, he was actually a rocket scientist. And in the 1980s, he had worked with the Reagan administration to cast doubt on the significance and severity of acid rain. In the 1990s, he joined the campaign to cast doubt on the scientific consensus on the ozone hole and the evidence of the harms of global warming. And like Frederick Seitz, he also worked for the tobacco industry. In the early 1990s, Singer joined forces with the Philip Morris tobacco industry to defend secondhand smoke. This defense, sometimes Americans like to quote the uh, great football coach, Vince Lombardi, who used to say the best defense is offense. Well, that's the approach that the tobacco industry took when it tried to defend secondhand smoke by attacking the United States Environmental Protection Agency. 
1993, Fred Singer and Kent Jeffries wrote a report called EPA and the Science of Environmental Tobacco Smoke. And there's a nice little aside here. Most people at this time were referring to the problem as secondhand smoke. And the tobacco industry decided they didn't like that term because they reckoned that Americans didn't like secondhand things. So it would be better to call it environmental tobacco smoke because that was less frightening. That was more benign. Only the only thing they didn't anticipate was that if it was environmental tobacco smoke, then it fell under the rubric of the Environmental Protection Agency. So that was a rare tactical error on the part of the tobacco industry. So they attacked the EPA and they wrote this report, which was published by a, an, another think tank, a think tank called the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute, but with the funding coming from the tobacco industry. Um, a lot of people have asked me about the whole money trail, and it's, it's difficult sometimes to know exactly where the funding from all of this is coming from because one of the things that these people do is that they have a kind of shell game where the money gets transferred from one place to another so it becomes quite hard to follow the trails. But the great thing about tobacco litigation is that there's so much public documentation that we can actually see how this operates in the case of tobacco. So the tobacco industry created an organization called the Tobacco Institute, which ostensibly supported research, but it was distracting and diverting research. The tobacco industry funneled money to the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute, and then the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute hires Singers and Jeffries to write this report, which is then released and promoted by two Republican members of Congress who have a press release using the information in the report to challenge the EPA. So, you know, it's moving from one place to another, and unless you really pay attention, you wouldn't see that the tobacco industry was funding and driving the whole thing all along. Now, why were they attacking the EPA? Well, the EPA had declared secondhand smoke to be a class A or proven carcinogen, and this result had been affirmed by the U.S. Surgeon General. In fact, an independent expert panel of oncologists, epidemiologists, and public health officials had concluded that secondhand smoke was responsible for 3,000 additional lung cancer deaths in the United States alone, not including additional evidence from Japan, Germany, and other places, and as many as 300,000 additional cases of bronchitis and pneumonia in infants and young children. Moreover, the scientific evidence showed a correlation between secondhand smoke and sudden infant death syndrome, also known as cot death. This evidence was supported by literally thousands of independent, diverse scientific studies, both in the United States, Europe, and Japan. So why would a rocket scientist challenge it? Indeed, why would anyone defend a product that kills infants in their cribs? Well, Fred Singer answered that question in his own words. He wrote, if we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, there's essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. So there it is, the slippery slope, the road to serfdom. Today, tobacco, tomorrow, the Bill of Rights. And this, it's this suspicion that leads to this allegation that environmentalists are actually socialists in disguise, referring to environmentalists as watermelons, green on the outside, red on the inside. <laughs> The commentator George Will, who writes for the Washington Post, has called environmentalism a green tree with red roots. And Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, um, who's known to many climate scientists, has threatened to indict climate scientists for part, being part of a liberal conspiracy to bring down global capitalism, to which I say scientists should be so organized. <laughs> Throughout their writings, these contrarians assert that environmentalists, and by implication, the scientists working on environmental issues, have a hidden socialist agenda. So Fred Singer, when he was working on the ozone hole, wrote, and then there are probably those with hidden agendas of their own, not just to save the environment, but to change our economic system. Some of these coercive utopians are socialists, some are technology-hating Luddites, and most have a great desire to regulate on as large a scale as possible. Now, this conviction that environmental regulation is really a rearguard attack on freedom helps to explain the origins of this story in the Cold War and strategic defense. These scientists who I've been talking about were all Cold Warriors who had all dedicated their lives to protecting the free world. And they saw the defense of free markets as an extension of their life's work. And it also explains one additional key part of the story, the part that links this rather American story to the rest of the world. And I know this is a very US-centric story, but that's 
deliver it. It's, it's, it is, in fact, a story about something that emerged in the United States, but spread then to other places, including Australia. That is to say, the promotion of doubt by think tanks promoting the free market, who are supported in turn by major corporations for whom money is at stake. So in the book, we track the origins of the story. We show how it really begins it, among just a few people, one think tank, but then it spreads. And it spreads to a network of think tanks who are all committed to neoliberal thinking. So if we go back to Singer and Jeffries and this report that they wrote, I've already mentioned that it was published by the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute. But who are they and where did they come from? Well, the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute is a think tank whose goal is, quote, the extension and perfection of democracy and economic liberty and political freedom. So there it is. There's your capitalism and freedom. Now, in practice, the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute works for lower taxes and less regulation of industry. And who was Ken Jeffries anyway? Well, he was a lawyer affiliated with the Cato Institute and the Competitive Enterprise Institute. The Cato Institute, in their own words, is dedicated to individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. The Competitive Enterprise Institute, in their own words, expanding liberty, increasing individual opportunity, and strengthening free markets. Free markets, free markets, free markets. Now, in the 1990s, then, we see a growth of these think tanks. And it's very interesting that we see the extension and expansion of this campaign right around the time of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Right? So I began this talk talking about the science that had led to President George H.W. Bush signing the Framework Convention. And at the same time, we also see then the expansion of this network of doubt and a kind of proliferation of these think tanks becoming involved in this issue. So we've already mentioned Alexis de Tocqueville, Cato, American Enterprise, Competitive Enterprise, but also the Heartland Institute who have been active here in Australia, the Acton Institute, the Frontiers of Freedom, the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, and here in Australia, the Institute for Public Affairs. All of these institutes promote freedom. And who could disagree with that? But who funds these groups, and what do they really represent? Well, to the extent that we can follow the money trail, what we see is what, by now, I'm sure you're expecting. The tobacco industry, the fossil fuel industry, the mining industry, the chemical industry. All regulated industries, all industries with heavy environmental footprints, all industries that stand to lose from government regulation. But rather than fighting regulation, rather than trying to defend against the obvious evidence of the harms that these industries can do, they hide it under these, the rubric of freedom and liberty. And also, much of the funding comes not necessarily directly from industries, although in many cases it is direct, but sometimes through libertarian foundations, such as Olin, Scaife, Smith Richardson, Coors, and the Charles Koch Foundation. So we see these foundations, you know, in some cases we see these foundations funding the think tanks that fund the doubt mongering. And it's interesting if you look at these, with the exception of Coors, which is beer, all of these got their money originally from petroleum. But what of their allegation that environmentalism is actually socialism in disguise? Is there any truth to that allegation? Is there any truth to that suggestion? Well, we know something about the history of the origins of the environmental movement. And the origins of the environmental movement are not to be found in socialist or left-wing politics, but rather in the progressive republicanism of US President Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, the first director of the US Forest Service, and of course that famous communist, John D. Rockefeller. <laughs> Throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in the United States, there was a bipartisan consensus on the importance of environmental protection. Indeed, when the Wilderness Act of 1964 designated over 9 million acres of American lands as areas where man himself is a visitor and does not remain, it passed the US Senate by a vote of 73 to 12, and the House of Representatives by a vote of 373 to 1. In the 1970s, the Environmental Protection Agency, attacked by the tobacco industry, was founded and created by the Republican President Richard Nixon, who signed into law several key pieces of environmental legislation, including the Clean Air Act extension, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and the National Environmental Policy Act. 
And it's important to note, too, that these signature pieces, these landmark pieces of environmental legislation, became models for similar laws throughout the world, including here in Australia. Now, things did begin to change in the 1980s, and this is one of those historical contingencies that historians pay a lot of attention to, things that just happened by chance but had important social, political, or economic ramifications. And the thing that happened by chance here is that in the 1980s, scientists, not environmentalists, but scientists, discovered a set of serious problems a serious environmental problems that were not amenable to local solutions, that could not be solved simply by setting aside a beautiful area of land around Yosemite or Yellowstone National Park or the Northern Territory, but problems like acid rain, the ozone hole, and global warming that seemed to demand national and international cooperation, that seemed to demand regulation of markets because certain products and activities were having serious environmental consequences. And these scientific issues discovered by scientists researching the natural world emerged just as the Reagan administration and the Thatcher administration were arguing for less government, less regulation, and also less internationalism. And it put the Reagan administration and later much of the Republican Party and really the whole ideology of deregulation on a collision course with modern science. Now, of course, the environmental movement has changed since the days of John D. Rockefeller, and some environmentalists might be socialists. But it doesn't mean the science is wrong. It doesn't mean that DDT, acid rain, the ozone hole, and secondhand smoke weren't real problems needing real solutions, problems that don't go away by denying them, by putting your head in the sand, or by attacking the scientists who, who revealed those problems. And it certainly doesn't justify the misrepresentation of science or the shameless personal attacks on the integrity of individual scientists. Moreover, we know something about possible solutions to these problems. So there's been a lot of discussion in recent months about emissions trading. And we know something about emissions trading because we've used it in the past. In the United States and in Europe, emissions trading was implemented in the 1990s to control the pollution that causes acid rain. And when emissions trading was implemented, many representatives of industry you know, were panic-stricken, said this will cost jobs, this will cause the electric cost of electricity to rise, this will wreck the economy of the, United, the Midwest of the United States, but it didn't. On the contrary, when emissions trading was implemented in the United States, acid emissions fell, electricity prices fell, and the people in the United States, in the Midwest, did not find themselves with notably less liberty or freedom than other US citizens. And we've learned a few things since 1962 about the relationship between capitalism and freedom. The fact is that Friedrich Hayek was wrong about the road to serfdom. He predicted, among other things, that if labor came to power in the United Kingdom and instituted social democracy, it would lead to fascism. But it didn't. Indeed, virtually every major European country after World War II, England, France, Germany, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, all instituted some form of social democracy, and none of them became fascistic or tyrannical. On the contrary, these countries all became more egalitarian and more democratic than they had been before the war. And Milton Friedman was wrong about the inextricable link between economic and political freedom. So just consider for a moment the recent histories of Chile and in China. In Chile in the 1970s, Augusto Pinochet overthrew a democratically elected socialist government and instituted a capitalist dictatorship. So just because you have capitalism does not mean that you have freedom. And in China today, we have a previously unimagined form of communistic capitalism that doesn't even have a name. I was reading literature to try to find out what economists even call this. Recently, some people have started referring to it as market authoritarianism. So capitalism, but without the freedom. And think about England, where capitalism was invented. In the 19th century, England prohibited the emigration of skilled workers. This is why you got all these unskilled workers coming to Australia, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> and think about the long history of slavery in the United States. So the slippery slope to socialism argument just isn't true. 
And we also know from history, as well as recent events from Wall Street to the Gulf of Mexico, that free markets require regulation to operate as free markets and to avoid the so-called negative externalities, the costs that accrue to people who do not reap the benefits of those activities. That is to say, like the cost of carbon pollution. And finally, there's a deep irony at the root of this whole story. Because while we have delayed acting on global warming, we've delayed acting since 1992, since the UN Framework Convention was signed, and while we've delayed, the problem has gotten steadily worse. And many climate scientists now think that we are reaching, or perhaps have even passed, crucial tipping points that could lead to true crises. And the longer we wait, the more we increase the likelihood that we will need intrusive government action to prevent catastrophe. So by fostering delay, the merchants of doubt have made it more likely that the very thing they most dreaded, intrusive government intervention and loss of liberty, might actually end up having to occur. Now, I would suggest that no one is an advocate of intrusive government, that no one opposes freedom or liberty. But as the philosopher Isaiah Berlin pointed out, there are trade-offs, and liberty for wolves can mean death to sheep. This is Australia, so I should probably say dingoes. <laughs> All societies accept some limitations on the action of others, because without such limits, there would be no civil society. And we judge, we create those limits, we decide where those limits on personal liberty should be based on our judgment of the potential risks and harms to others. And this is why it is so important for all of us to understand climate science, to understand the facts about what's happening and the projections of what's likely to happen, because it's science that explains the harms and the risks that we face. So to conclude, in 1990, Richard Darman, the director of the Office of Management and Budget under President George H.W. Bush, dismissed the concerns of environmentalists derisively, saying, Americans did not fight and win the wars of the 20th century to make the world safe for green vegetables. <laughs> well, I would submit that we didn't make the world safe for green vegetables, nor for polar bears, nor for Pacific Islanders. And if we don't act soon, it may not be safe for us either. Now, this is a pretty serious talk, but I actually have a good sense of humor, so I like to try to end on a humorous note. Uh, but the caption in the final slide is a little hard to read, so I'll read it to you. And it says, I'm sorry, Harold, but I'm reducing our carbon footprint. <laughs> Thank you very much.